Good morning, apes, or good afternoon, apes. We are coming at you live very late here today. It is approximately 2.16 p.m. here on this beautiful Friday, March 1st. Happy March, everybody. March 1st, 2024. The only March 1st, 2024 you're ever going to have in your entire life, and it's a Friday. So might as well make the most of it out there. Go do something stupid and tell me about it next week. Anyway, you guys know what we're coming at you live with here today. It is, of course, the Daily Peel live from the Daily Peel Global Headquarters. We got edition number 658 out for you guys today. And... You know, I know I say every day that it's a big one. We got a lot to talk about today. Today, that's probably never been more true. We're talking inflation and earnings, pretty much the only two things that market watchers actually care about right now. So if there was ever a daily peel to read, send to your friends, get them on board, this is going to be the big one. All right, but we can go ahead and get started here today. We got a lot to talk about. We have no financial fraud. We have no memes of the day or anything like that. So sorry to disappoint. But what we do have is the latest data on inflation and the inflationary data that the Fed actually gives a shit about because it's calculated by somebody with a brain, unlike the CPI report. So that's always good to see. We had some major stock movements of the day. My personal favorite thing, seeing AMC shares decline. So we'll obviously rip into them a little bit. And then finally, we'll finish things up by talking all things earnings for Q4 so far. Get our thoughts on what's going to be happening going forward for the rest of the year. So stay tuned for all of that. All right. And if we go ahead and take a look at the market snapshot here, I mean, this is honestly just embarrassing how close we are to the S&P 500. Is the S&P 500 even a real index? I mean, the apes over at WSO Alpha are just about absolutely smoking this thing. We did underperform by a single basis point yesterday, but obviously that's a, that's some kind of an error on the S&P's part. We are underperforming by five basis points for the year so far. Underperforming the NASDAQ by a whole lot more, but we don't have to talk about that. Let's just go ahead and pretend it doesn't exist. But the Alpha portfolio is still looking pretty good overall. Like I said yesterday, we did start to reallocate some of that cash. So if you want to see what those trades we're placing are, go ahead and sign up. You can find that on WSAlpha.com. Go ahead and check things out there. We also do have our Tesla report set to be released over this weekend. So if you want to make fun of me for my stupid takes on that, got to sign up for this one. It's not going to be free like the Zillow report. Sorry to disappoint, but definitely stay tuned. You know, we are still seeing some strong movements from Bitcoin. Did fall back below that $62,000 level, but we're seeing Ethereum continue to absolutely rip getting up closer to the $3,400 range, which it hasn't been uh, since years ago. If it even, it was over 4,200 or something at some point, but it's been quite a while since we've seen ETH up this high. Took a lot longer for ETH to catch up and start seeing the gains that Bitcoin did, but nonetheless, that's where we're at right now. It's actually even outperforming to the year. All right, now we can go ahead and take a look at some of the banana bits for the day. We do have more all-time highs to celebrate this week, Apes. The NASDAQ officially closed at a new all-time high yesterday. That was obviously great to see. I just bought a NASDAQ 20K hat, so you'll see me wearing that as soon as we hit that 20K mark. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later, but hopefully not too soon that the WSO Alpha portfolio doesn't get there beforehand. But either way, we're definitely excited to see it. Meanwhile, Elon Musk's Optimus robots are getting some steady competition already. Uh, some startup out of Silicon Valley, I think it was called Figures, they're developing equally as creepy humanoid robots to come and ruin factories and take away even more jobs from hardworking Americans. So stay tuned on that because it's going to be quite the development going forward. And B. Riley Financial, kind of a holding company of a lot of different, I guess, financial-based companies, they are about to go BK. They're about to get Frank Castled from publicly traded markets. They are looking at, uh, they're essentially looking into selling a lot of different parts of their business so that they can avoid actually going bankrupt. So definitely go ahead and check out that story. It's not looking good for them over there. Just like we learned this morning, it is certainly not looking good for companies like New York Community Bank or even companies like Fisker too, the EV company. Both we'll be talking about tomorrow or actually on Monday, but I've already written both parts for those. So of course that was pretty hysterical to see. All right, and then finally supply chain stress is back to pre-COVID-19 levels, according to Lizanne Saunders on Twitter. Uh, don't really know how they track supply chain stress. Stress. It's probably even worse than how they track the CPI data and inflation via the CPI, but still, that's something that we're seeing as well. Looks like these companies can't use supply chains as an excuse anymore, but I'm sure they will going forward. So, oh, guys, we actually got a, uh, we got a solid advertisement in here today. Everybody go check out the Academy here. I know you guys are dying to work in high finance, so... If anybody wants that guaranteed, go ahead and check out the Academy. Nice and convenient today. You can get in on this. You can get in on this application tracker right here. I mean, Ankit, he's an absolute beast with it. He's out there sleuthing the internet all day. 
strictly for open job applications, you're definitely going to want to have his contact info. So go ahead and check things out there. All right, but let's go ahead and move into the macro story of the day. This was really, it was, you know, expected to be the first market mover, the first real catalyst for market moving in any direction uh, in quite a while. We've kind of been sitting on our hands, you know, besides the NVIDIA report, there wasn't really a whole lot throughout the month of February that moved markets. Maybe that's a good thing because, you know, at least it didn't move things lower, but I need some excitement back in my life. Maybe now the Silicon Valley bank collapse. Probably shouldn't speak too soon because it seems like New York Community Bank is about to do that. Probably see JP Morgan to the rescue again. But let's go ahead and get back to talking about inflation so my ADHD doesn't completely take things over here. So yesterday, we got the chillest PCE report just about of all time. Markets did have a little bit of a panic attack in the immediate response to it. But once again, actually, once traders actually had time to read what was in the report, instead of just blindly reacting to the numbers that they saw, they started to understand that, you know, it's not actually as bad as it seemed. Headline PCE increased 0.3% in January. Whereas the core PCE reading increased 0.4% in January. Now, the PCE report, this is the personal consumption expenditures report, differs slightly from the CPI because one, the basket is updated much more regularly. Two, they don't determine home prices by going and asking dumbass homeowners that don't know shit about anything what they think that they could rent out their house for. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Uh, but either way, it's like assessing candy prices by asking first graders what they would pay for a Starburst or something. Like, it's just... Makes absolutely no sense. Sure, it might have worked back in the 60s, but in 2024, we can track this a little bit better. So that's why we prefer the PCE, and that's why the Fed prefers the PCE as well, because it's measured in a much more sensible manner. It actually uh, kind of lines up with economic reality. But some quick math for everybody, just to have this context, I don't know if anybody's ever stated this before, but we always target that 2% annual inflationary increase. But what does that mean in terms of monthly growth? What we'd be looking at is about 0.165% monthly increases to annualize that rate to a full 2%. So we're still well above that annualized rate, but hey, moving in the right direction, especially on an annualized basis. So the scary part of the PCE report and the reason that traders kind of shit themselves in the immediate aftermath was because it came out hotter than the December number. So we were about a couple of basis points higher than what was reported in December on both the core and the headline number. But if we go ahead and look at the annual figures here, which trading economics provides very nicely in this chart here, I'll almost use this chart as my background today, actually. But this is really the important point. We are still seeing inflation trend in the right direction. And so not really a whole lot to be worried about, uh, especially in that regard from this report. Now, uh, obviously, there was a whole lot more in the report. Oh, Venkata, hello to you, too. Thanks for joining us here today. Glad to see you on the live. Anyway, <laughs> getting back to it, uh, most of... Most of this increase, so in the PCE report, the price index is only a small portion of what's actually being reported. The kind of headline number and the main purpose is to see personal consumption and to assess exactly what that was. And so as a big part of that, we start with what overall income levels were. We saw a jump in income levels in January. 1% increase in a single month is huge, but it's not anything to get excited about. Really, all it is is grandma and grandpa stealing more of your money. That's going into the social security system. Basically, we did see a cost of living adjustment coming into 2024, plus a whole lot more people signing up, Affordable Care Act shit, bunch of bullshit that I'm not going to read into, but it did increase wages. It's not because people are earning more money. It's because of increased government spending. So it doesn't really necessarily count too much, even though it will increase GDP. We'll see if that can translate into consumer spending growth, because that's what truly matters. We did see personal savings rate move just a little bit higher from 3.7% in December to 3.8%. Uh, I don't know why you guys are saving money. The economy needs you right now. Go out and spend all of that. Take out debt if you have to. Just make sure that you're doing something to contribute to the economy. Then, of course, we saw disposable incomes. This is what really matters because this is kind of net of taxes or net of government interference. They rose as well, just very slightly at 0.3% rate. So no real growth to disposable personal incomes. I think the exact terminology they used in the report was less than 0.1% which translated into English means about 0% for all of those that don't speak macro. All right. And then, of course, if we kind of take this into some context a little bit here, this gives us an explanation for something that we were freaking out about earlier this week. We were kind of like a toddler with a hammer on fire when it came to the durable goods report because we saw the largest drop in durable goods spending since April of 2020. That's definitely a scary thought. Whenever it's the biggest or smallest anything since April or March of 2020, that is definitely going to strike fear into the hearts of market participants. But that is what we saw earlier this week. 
And it makes sense once you put it in context with the PCE report, because what we saw was a 1.1% decline in goods spending, but a 0.4% increase in services spending. So basically, as long as people are still spending money, like the US economy is absolutely addicted to, then GDP growth, everything should be fine going forward, as long as we keep having those companies' earnings, which we'll talk about in just a quick second. The other big thing from this report was that it absolutely did not change the market's view on rate expectations going forward whatsoever. If we go ahead and take a look at the probabilities chart for this May meeting, guys, I know this is an absolutely disgusting image. It looks a whole lot better if you click on this source link right here. Couldn't recommend it enough. But this is the important line item to be looking at right here. So this bottom line here where it says 525 to 550 current, this is basically the market weighted probabilities that rates are going to be in at that same level after the May meeting. So that is exactly what they're saying right here. And they're basically expecting like expectation went from 81.3% to remain in that same to remain in that same range at the May meeting to 80.7% or 80.2% if I can read that correctly basically moved barely more than 1% nothing really to be too concerned about so the market didn't actually care all that much you know basically if we take this all together what we're seeing is inflation continue to decline Jobs reports continue to come in strong. Wages still outpacing inflation, uh, at least at the headline level, not necessarily at the uh, disposable personal income level. But, you know, those are kind of the three things that sound like a soft landing to me. Let me know if you disagree, but it seems like j Powell is the new Sully and really knows how to land a plane. All right, but let's go ahead and move into some of the biggest stock movers of the day. We got C3AI with a ticker symbol like that. How are you not going to be booming these days? Their ticker symbol is literally AI. That might be the company's most valuable asset. But either way, another valuable asset that they had was beating the shit out of their earnings report in Q4. They reported a sizable beat on uh, losing only 13 cents per share versus the 28 per share expected. Less than half the loss that the market was pricing in originally. But still, setting money on fire isn't generally recommended as a long-term growth strategy. I guess unless you're Jeff Bezos. But sales also beat estimates as well, coming in about $3.4 million above what those estimates were. So CEO Tom Siebel, he came out and said that growth is accelerating, got everybody fired up. But shares are still down about 75% from their February 2021 peak. Uh, as somebody who held shares during that time period, you don't have to remind me that they're down a shit ton. But with a ticker symbol like that, who knows what can happen going forward. Quite honestly, I think most people that buy this company don't even read what the actual name of the firm is. They just see AI, probably assume it's some kind of AI ETF, and off to the races it is, as it was yesterday. All right, and then, of course, we got Duolingo. I actually got a notification on my phone from my Duolingo app today that said it was going to kick the living shit out of me if I didn't write something positive uh, in today's peel. They get really aggressive with those warnings, and I think it's just out of love here. But if you can't read this first sentence right here, then you need a Duolingo subscription. And it says, uh, what a day for Duolingo, or what a great day for Duolingo, for all of my non-Spanish speakers out there. If anybody wants to correct me in the comments, please feel free to. I got a D- minus in Spanish in high school, good times back then. All right, but anyway, enough about me. Duolingo, they actually killed it in Q4 earnings. They were blessed with the gift of extremely low expectations coming into their earnings report, fortunately, because we expect companies like ChatGPT, Gemini, or whatever the fuck Google Bard is called nowadays, things like that to take away from these outside educational providers like Duolingo, like Chegg, and like a few of the other publicly traded companies that operate within a similar space. Still, Duolingo managed to pull it out, and because they pulled it out with expectations so low, they saw an outsized day rising nearly, uh, or a little bit over 22%. All right, moving into the what's rotten names of the day. Snowflake, man, this really killed us yesterday. We do hold Snowflake in the WSO Alpha portfolio. Without Snowflake, we easily would have outperformed the S&P on the day. But because we do hold shares, we just kind of had to take it on the chin. Still pretty confident going forward, but basically what happened is the CEO... Apparently, there's some kind of cult of personality around this guy. His name's Trevor Slootman, and apparently every shareholder and their mother absolutely loves him. They say that he's the kind of guy that you want dating your daughter and your sister at the exact same time. So, you know, interesting character to see leave, but obviously Marcus absolutely lost it. He came out yesterday and said, you know, it's not a cult of personality. It's going to be fine or whatever. The share price says differently. Either way, they did manage to, uh, they came in a little bit below on guidance for expectations in Q1 going forward, expecting revenue to come in somewhere between 745 and 750 million, whereas the street wanted about 759 million. Uh, obviously, they threw a temper tantrum at that. Morgan Stanley did not hesitate whatsoever to downgrade shares, there being their usual hater selves over there, but they only bumped it down to equal weight from the outperform rating. So it's not like it's underweight or anything like that. 
that'd be a real slap in the face. But Q4 EPS did more than double estimates, sales beat as well. So it was definitely a solid last quarter, but it seems like they're trying to set themselves up well for a good ongoing quarter. We'll see what happens. It seems like the new CEO is going to have to get people fired up. But this is a company that's relied on, one, that CEO, and two, the fact that Warren Buffett invested in it for quite a long time to get the valuation multiple that was associated with it. So Snowflake, despite the fact that earnings are growing pretty strongly, seeing a lot of multiple compression, given that some of those things that drove a premium uh, valuation are going away, such as Warren Buffett's interest, such as the CEO that got people more fired up than Jesus Christ, it seems like. But either way, let's go ahead and move on to our next stock of the day. Always our favorite one to make fun of, and that is AMC Entertainment. If you are still holding this thing, I hope you are either in middle school or you might want to go to a doctor and get your IQ checked. But either way, shares were down 13.4% yesterday. Absolutely nobody is surprised. The company did manage to beat earnings reports, which to me has been the biggest surprise on Wall Street for the entire year. But it was all thanks to Travis Kelsey's girlfriend as well as Beyonce. Uh, basically, they released, you guys are all too familiar with the concert tours that they had last year. And they released concert tour movies alongside that. Those were the only reason, the, the exact quote that an analyst said was that concert movies drove, quote, literally all of the increase in revenue and earnings in Q4. So obviously it wasn't necessarily uh, something that the business was doing, but more so Taylor Swift, a.k.a. Travis Kelsey's girlfriend, dapping them up a little bit. Thank you very much, Otis. I appreciate that, man. That uh, gives me a reason to live. So you don't know how much that means to me. Anyway, let's go on down into the thought banana of the day. It was a really cute Q4. You know, we don't say this all the time, but when it comes to earnings report in Q4, that really is the best way to describe it because it wasn't too good. It wasn't too bad. Kind of like, you know, having a, a like a newborn toddler or something. It's like kind of cute looking, but it's a little bit ugly at the same time. That's really, but obviously you're going to call it cute to the parents. That's really how we were feeling about Q4 earnings. So high schools have the SATs. The NFL has the combine. Marker watchers, we have Q4 earnings reports. I don't know which one of those sound the most fun to you, but there's nothing more fun to me than pouring through endless pages of legal jargon and ridiculous accounting math that I pretend to understand. Uh, but that's exactly what we did for you guys yesterday with a big help from FactSet, who provided every single one of these images. Definitely go ahead and check out those FactSet earnings insight. I couldn't recommend subscribing to that email list enough. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to it and stop hyping up other newsletters. All right, so we did get 97% of S&P 500 companies have reported so far. That's probably more like 99.9% .9 when we're talking about total market cap of the S&P 500 that's reported so far. And overall, the story of the year or the story of the quarter was a high degree of winflation. So what we saw overall was 73% of S&P 500 companies exceeded their earnings estimates, exceeded what the street consensus view on earnings was. 73%, that might sound pretty good but it's a little bit lower than historical expectations. Now, this is a number that companies can play with a good bit as well. Simeon, what are you saying there? Holding AMC? Yeah, it absolutely is an IQ test. If you talk to somebody, that's my number one question. If you get a new financial advisor this year, ask them if they ever owned AMC or GME. If they did, kindly slap them in the face, pee on their desk, and walk out of the office. Getting back to the earnings numbers for this year. So we saw 73% of companies beat their EPS estimates. Now, Companies will play with their EPS estimates quite a bit. They'll guide for things that they know that they can probably beat. Plus, when it comes to actually determining EPS, there's a lot of moving factors that go into that, including things like share count, including things like operating expenses versus capitalized expenses. Certain companies, you can put big expenses into CapEx if you just categorize it a little bit differently, even when they probably should be OpEx. And so that allows them to kind of juice EPS estimates. That's why it's not good to see per share metrics kind of as the um, driver of what a CEO or manager's compensation is going to be because they are extremely gameable. So that's why we typically see companies beat more on the bottom line because it's something that you can control a little bit more than revenue. Now, revenue you still can control a little bit, but it's really only by saying, you know, we expect it to be lower than you actually expect it to be is what you're going to tell the street. Still, we saw 64% beat on revenue. Pretty good. It's low. Both of those numbers are lower than their five-year averages, right in line or at least very close to their 10-year averages overall. Nothing too good, nothing too bad to be worried about there. We did see communication services lead the sector or lead uh, all sectors in terms of overall earnings growth and EPS. That was almost entirely thanks to Meta and the team over at Facebook. So shout out to them for picking up the slack because they caused quite a lot of slack in 2022, but they finally paid it back. So I'd say we're finally even now. And then it was a good kind of, uh, it, that's actually a good Rorschach test for the economy as well there, because 
digital ad spending is one of the things that's incredibly volatile. Companies are only going to ramp up digital ad spending when they have extra cash to throw around. And so it's when you're expecting a recession or when you think a recession is going to come, like at the end of 2022, that's the first thing that companies are going to pull back on because it's non-essential spending. Yeah, it helps to have more digital advertising, but it's not super important. So it's typically the first thing that companies turn off when expecting a recession, but it'll get turned back on real quick when it's clear that that's not happening. And that's what we saw in Q4. That's why communication services was able to pad the stats of the index overall. Uh, and yeah, so we did see inflation mentioned 254 times, or basically the term inflation was mentioned at least once on earnings calls for 254 companies. That's over half the index that's still worried about inflation, even though we're basically back to normal levels at this point. So who cares? Why are we talking about overall earnings? Well, at the end of 2023, like we talked about, or like we've kind of talked about all week, economic data that came through in 2023 was pretty good almost across the board. We continue to climb a wall of worry because everybody was expecting the floor to be pulled out beneath us and everybody to fall through. But that's not really what happened. So obviously being the panicky, anxiety-ridden people that most traders and analysts are, this wasn't necessarily something that was uh, too exciting for them. They were looking for something to be worried about, essentially. And so that's basically what we saw right here is that the big thing that everybody was worried about was Q4 earnings. They were saying, you know, if there's a shoe to drop, it's going to be Q4 earnings if we see, you know, a solid downtrend in companies that beat. But that's not what we saw. And we actually did see 4% earnings growth for the entire in for the entire index as a whole. That was kind of the headlining numbers that we saw. So the floor didn't drop out beneath us. We didn't get that economic concern that a lot of people were worried about. And that's why we should care. But Either way, what we did see is that the changes in EPS estimates throughout the first two months of the year for the ongoing year. So what we're talking about is this is how much analysts have changed their expectations for earnings per share for the full year for the S&P 500 in just these first two months. They've knocked it down by about 0.3%, 30 basis points, much less than most years in the past, well below the average. And so that's kind of getting people fired up going into this year because maybe there's not enough to be worried about, especially if we continue to see inflation reducing while jobs hold up and while wages hold up as well. Uh, do you have an inflation to AI mention ratio? That's actually a really good question there, Sibian. That would be a good thing to look into right there. You might have just given us an idea for a thought banana on Monday because trust me, we definitely need it. But ultimately, the takeaway here was that uh, you know, they basically scored well. Like we said, it was pretty cute. It wasn't anything terrible. Uh, macro data is starting to shift just a little bit from being clearly positive to someone more positive to neutral. So that is really the kind of thing to be looking out for going forward, how a lot of these macro reports are going to impact earnings going forward, because ultimately it is those earnings that should be moving our portfolios. All right, ultimate questions to end the day. How did your portfolio do in Q4? Will S&P earnings be a legitimate cause of fear in 2024? What sectors will see the most growth this year? I mean, communications led in Q4. What do you think is going to lead in this upcoming quarter? Let's all do our favorite thing together and speculate wildly. All right. And then, of course, final quote of the day. We had to get Warren Buffett in here. Risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. Could not be more correct in that sense. Shout out to Warren again. We had to use a bunch of his quotes this week after his shareholder letter came out earlier this week or last weekend, I should say. But either way, that about does it for us today. Quick second to explain the chart behind me as well here. Guys, we meant to mention this when we were talking about inflation at the beginning, but this is really the most important chart in the market right now. It is here. I'll move out of the way so we can see the bottom of it too. This is basically showing how inflationary trends between the 1970s and what we're currently living through have kind of followed a similar trajectory so far. And if we do start to cut too early, then essentially we could risk seeing a return to 1980s inflation and Paul Boker coming in and walloping things. Druva, what's going on, buddy? Me and Druva actually went to college together. It's good to see you in there. I'm glad you're uh, watching my live stream. Hopefully liking and commenting later on so that I can keep my job as well there. Anyway, I'll certainly be looking out for the text messages once we hop off here, which is what we're going to do right now. Uh, shout out to everybody for joining us on the live stream. If you're listening later on, leave us a like, leave us a comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, do anything to help me keep my job here so that I can sleep peacefully at night. Always good to see you guys. I will see you again on Monday. Chris Guy, yeah, another guy that I went to college with. Love to see the uh, the representation from Bentley University, guys. All right. Before I get myself in trouble here, I am going to go ahead and call it because I know you guys are going to start saying some shit. So let's go ahead and end it right here. Thank you for joining us as always. Happy investing. Happy trading. 
<laughs> playing two times if you're held hostage. I appreciate the concern there, Sydney, and I will definitely be reaching out to you later on uh, to give you a full update on my health and safety status. Appreciate the concern from you guys. The chat is absolutely blowing up today. So that's stuff that we always love to see. I'm actually going to end it now. Happy investing, happy trading, everybody. Have a solid weekend. Go out there and donate to the economy. Bye now. And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, patrick at wallstreetoasis.com. Until next time.